Thank you, Carrie, for agreeing to speak to Kidney Matters. And we've got you in here, our advocacy officer, who has helped you somewhat over the past couple of years. So we'd like to know a little bit about your background, if that's all right with you. Um, so shall we start off with how old are you and and for how long have you known you've had kidney problems? Um, so I'm 22 and I've basically known I've had kidney problems for as long as I can remember. Um, when I was a wee girl, when I was about two, I was get, running really high temperatures and yeah, I was always getting urine infections and that was when I got taken in and they did biopsies on my kidneys and discovered that I had Allport syndrome. So basically my mum and dad both carried a really rare gene mm. and in turn I got quite a serious form mm-hmm. of Allports. Um, growing up it was basically checkups every six months at the hospital and it was never really that serious. I just saw it as like a day off school, eh, or an afternoon off school. and. Um, so I had my last appointment, I was seen every six months, I had my last appointment with adult services in April um, of 2014. With paediatric? With, with paediatric, so, sorry. Yeah. So, if you say that since I had my last appointment. Last appointment with paediatrics in April of 2014 and I was due to be seen at adults in October 2014 but sadly I fell unwell mm-hmm. um, in the August so I didn't really make it to that appointment okay. before I was taken into hospital. So <clears throat> when did you realise you were quite poorly? Talk about your holiday. Um, well, I went on holiday with my friends in August 2014 and I was really, really unwell when I was there. I spent three days or four days of the holiday just in bed and I was nearly having to get a plane home. But I managed to stay until all my friends were leaving and I remember I just collapsed at the airport I was really really unwell. Came home and it was just kind of back and forward to the GP and was diagnosed with glandular fever and then it was tonsillitis and during I think maybe three or four visits to the GP they never once took bloods um, despite the fact that it was known I had a kidney mm-hmm. condition. Um, <clears throat> And it wasn't until the end of September, so like five weeks, six weeks after I got back from a holiday, that I went to the practice manager, kind of head GP, and she decided to do a blood test. And it was two days later that they told me that I had. Okay. So I understand you did some family visits, though, in that time, and and you had some fairly proactive aunties on the case as well. So one of the times an aunt came to the house and she basically just said to me that I looked awful. By that point it was quite yellow and my eyes were quite a strange colour. And I went round to my other aunts for dinner. And I can remember, I mean I was only 18 at the time, but she lives literally just round the corner and I couldn't even walk home. Mm -hmm. Um, Because I I was so tired and so lethargic feeling. And she actually said to my dad, once she was dropping me off, she said, that girl needs a doctor, she's really not well. Mm. My uncle had commented how at dinner my eyes had kind of rolled to the back of my head and I just didn't look like I was with it there. And I just remember, I just felt terrible, basically. Okay. So you went to, so the sequence of events, you went then to a GP who took the whole thing much more seriously, did some blood tests and you went to college one day and you found out they'd missed two calls. Yeah, two missed calls. So one was from the GP and one was from my dad. And I thought I'll phone my dad first. And um, he lived, he works 40 minutes away and basically the GP's not allowed to tell him what was wrong because I was 18. But she just basically said to my dad, I advise you to leave work right now and go and pick her up. So my dad had obviously said this to him on the phone. I phoned the GP and it was there that she said, yeah, your kidneys aren't working at all. Basically, they were five percent. My dad picked me up, took me to Inverclyde Royal, and they—that was where I was transferred by ambulance up to the Western. At the time, they were like the kidney mm-hmm. specialists up there. I was taken up, and they hoped that the kidneys would kick back in, but they never did. Basically, no. So, 
So when you were admitted to hospital, mm -hmm. then, I mean, and clearly both you and your dad were told that you had no kidney function yeah. and that the only way to deal with this was dialysis, possible transplant. Yeah. So what happened to you at that point? So they started you on dialysis yeah. quickly. What did they do to you? Yeah, they put a, a line in my groin initially, but they're not um, a kind of long-term thing. So what was in... I don't think it was in for very long. Mm. I'm not sure if it was a week or two, but it could be as long as that. Before I was taken down to Deer Town, they put a chest line in, mm -hmm. and I did six months of hemodialysis in the meantime. So that took me to April, and then I got the PD tube put in, and I started PD four times a day. Okay. Up until I got the kidney. Okay. From my dad. So right at the same time you were admitted first to hospital, what was you developed up to? Sorry? When you were first admitted to hospital then, what was your dad up to uh, immediately? He, so right away he went for testing, like literally the same day. They took him and they done like the first few tests, I'm not even sure what they were at the time, yeah. but just a couple of initial tests and I think it was determined he was a three out of six match or okay. something like that. Okay. Yeah. Does that sound right? Yeah. Um, so him and also my uncle went for testing but my dad was the better match. Okay. Um, but it took longer for my dad to be tested because he carried the all-porch gene. So they had to contact a specialist up in Edinburgh who then said, look, it would be fine. Mm -hmm. Like, there was not really any other risk to my dad. Okay. <clears throat> so, <coughs> so your dad and you went into hospital on the 30th of September 2015. Yeah, so we went in the night before. Uh -huh. We went in on the 29th of okay. September. Um, his room was just up from mine and basically told us what would happen during the operation, mm -hmm. how you'd feel after. My dad went down first on the morning of September the 30th, I think it was a Wednesday or a Thursday, and he went down, and I think it took about three hours mm -hmm. for him, and I remember the surgeon came up to me and he said, to you, the kidney's out, it's a lovely looking kidney basically. Um, it's a different language, isn't uh -huh. it? He said, he said it was really big. He commented on that. And he said, we'll just get you down. It was a Dr Kingsmore that, Mr Kingsmore that done the operation. And he got me down and the kidney worked right away from mm -hmm. the operating table. I passed urine. Mm -hmm. okay, um, the creatinine was 60. You know, it was functioning really well. And it was plain sailing for three months. And just so that we touch a bit more on Dan, what, Dad's a really fit person now, isn't he? Yeah. And what does he do now? So less than, I would say less than six months after the operation, he was swimming. Yeah. Again, I think maybe about three months after he was swimming, but I think he was doing like the proper open water swimming. Mm -hmm. About six months yeah. later, yeah. he swam the Clyde just on Saturday yeah. as well. Like you would never know. No, good. But it's good. good. So... Things didn't really go that swimmingly for you. So oh. let's just talk through your first year with your with your new kidney. What, how did you start the year? Well, the first three months were great. I think I was only at a hospital every three weeks or every month. I think mm -hmm. that was about the longest I got. Um, and then at the three month mark, my creatinine, which sat at 60, 59, 60, it, sat at, it jumped up to 99, which was obviously still a really good creatinine yes. but for me it was a massive jump um, and they had said do oh, we think you've got rejection so they treated me for rejection the creatinine went back down again and then maybe about three months later the March 2016 I had another jump in creatinine and I had a biopsy and they said that they thought I had BK virus mm -hmm. um, so there was a lot of scarring on the kidney and then I kept getting lots of infections, bacterial infections, viral infections, and tonsillitis two or three times during the year that I had the kidney. And every time I was going to hospital, the creatinine was just getting higher and higher. Mm -hmm. Like slowly but surely, it was just keeping up. I had more biopsies, and then I was put on a drug um, that was thought it was for uh, people with arthritis called leflunamide. Put me on that, which studies have shown it can inhibit the virus and take it out of the kidney but it didn't it really work for me okay. um, and in December I think it was the 6th of December 2016 
my doctor basically said this isn't going to be a kidney that lasts mm-hmm. what we told like 20 25 years said you I think you'll be lucky if you get five um and I think it was the following month the end of January I get admitted to hospital and my kidney and had the kidney had basically failed right. yeah and so so I understand that you went back on dialysis in February 2017 yep. and you elected to, to plump for PD again. Yeah. Now, things were a little bit different this time, weren't they? Because yeah. you weren't producing any urine. And so tell me how you got on with PD. Well, initially, my creatinine had came down because I still had the transplant in, so I was still passing a little. But at the end of February, so the Less than a month after being on PD, it was about three weeks I got my transplant removed. Mm-hmm. Um, and that took away my urine output, so I relied really heavily on PD. So it became like, I think initially I was doing maybe like eight hours on the machine, then it became nine, and then it was nine and a half, and then it was nine and a half plus two manual bags. You know, it was one at tea time, one before you go to bed, and then mm-hmm. nine and a half hours. And it just became too much. Okay, so I'm guessing that that just didn't fit in with your life at no. that moment and you were back at college mm-hmm. and trying to juggle college and you're young and you yeah. want to go out with your friends. So you had a fistula form. So I had a fistula. Along with I managed to get to Florida in the June. Mm-hmm. Um, so about four months later, I went to Florida and I literally came back from Florida. I think it was a Wednesday and I had the fistula made on a Thursday. It was literally the day after because my creatinine was sitting at that point at 1600 so it was too high for some of my so and so little yeah so you obviously had quite a strong fistula because they used it quite quickly Uh, ah it was used by the july so now we are at a situation today Mm -hmm. where you're dialyzing a tuesday a thursday and a saturday at inverclyde and you um and that and, and that's where we are today. So what we're going to do now is we're going to bring you in into the conversation, and you. It was your dad that got in touch with the advocacy team, yeah. and tell me about what you and um, has done for you. So um, it was obviously my dad that met with you first and met for a coffee and spoke about the help that the service can provide and. I remember I got in touch with you shortly after and he had said to me that he knew another young girl my age which was quite a good thing because everyone I saw at dialysis was much older and I'd never really seen anyone my age that had been on it although the girl wasn't on it anymore she'd had a transplant and basically a couple of weeks later we met in a cafe and she brought like her transplant drugs along and you and my dad went and sat somewhere else and me and her sat together and she basically just spoke about how different her life was with the kidney. Although she had like a few problems, basically said like it was worth it mm. compared to the alternative, basically. Yeah. Um, Absolutely. And it was just nice to meet someone that was my age. So she's like your kidney buddy, but yeah. you certainly you rely on you and for you know if you want to chat things through, and he gives you information and sort of points you in the right direction. Yeah. And he's just that person to be there, and and. Because he's been through it, you, you found him very comfortable to talk to. Yeah. Has, in what way has he helped you practically with so things? So um, during the time that I was on dialysis, I was taking driving lessons and hoping to obviously set a test, but driving lessons are quite expensive. So I got in touch with Ewan and he managed to fill out a form and stuff and managed to apply for a grant to pay for the driving lessons and the driving test. So I think I got them in January of 2015 and I passed my test in the April mm-hmm. of 2015 which was a massive help because it gave me my independence and also the when I was on PD the clinic was up in Glasgow so I could drive mm-hmm. from there without having to go on trains and buses. I could just drive straight up to yeah. the hospital. That's which fantastic. Was good. Yeah. Good. Okay, so now I'm going to bring you in. in. And uh, you and if you fill in the gaps there, so what? So it was it was um, Carrie's father that got in touch with you, Archie. That's one, yes. And what did Archie say to you? Archie just simply said that uh, he appraised me of Carrie's situation and said that both he and Carrie were 
extremely concerned about what was facing them. And um, he discussed his fears for his daughter. Uh, he explained to me that um, he was a single father because Carrie lost her mum mm -hmm. a number of years previously and that he was looking for some help and information. And the first thing I arranged, as Carrie has already said, was the, the buddying up with someone who'd been through that situation. It's always best to try and find someone of a similar age and circumstance. Mm -hmm. I've been through it. Mm -hmm. I'm uh, three times Carrie's age. A little bit of all that. <laughs> <laughs> and although I could impart some information to yeah. her, she really couldn't relate to someone of my age. Um, so that meeting was set up, and I think it was initially it was quite successful. Mm -hmm. uh, you gained a lot of information from Becca. Um, and I think I also supplied you with some booklets mm -hmm. um, that uh, Kidney Care produce okay. on various different topics. You and as Advocacy Officer for Kidney Care UK, um, we know what help you offered Carrie, we've just done the interview, what other help can you offer kidney patients that come to you in this area? We're able to offer a range of services supplied by Kidney Care UK. Um, the advocacy covers many, many subjects, including um, particular treatments uh, that they are either getting or don't want. It involves transport benefits, uh, holiday grants, hardship grants. It could be uh, housing issues. Uh, it could be adaptations needed in their house, mm -hmm. whole range of things. Mm -hmm. But of course, in the Kidney Care UK Armoury, there are also uh, tremendous information services. And if there's any information we can't find, we can signpost them to where they will get it. Mm -hmm. uh, and we make sure they get accurate and timely information. Mm -hmm. and, you, and you remain in contact with a lot of your patients for quite a long time. Yes, a lot of patients um, are dealt with in one phone call. They are satisfied with the answers they've received uh, or the uh, information that they've asked for. Uh, other patients, it's an ongoing relationship. And I have one patient at the moment that I'm now on to about the sixth subject mm -hmm. that I've dealt with him. Uh, and he's very happy, yeah. he's comfortable speaking to an advocacy officer and he keeps coming back because he knows he's going to get help. And what area of the country do you, let, let's guess, but what particular area of the country do you cover? I officially cover the whole of Scotland. Okay. Um, I've been unable to do that in practical terms. Um, if I tried to do it, I'd spend most of my working week in, in a car or a train. So I try and um, prioritise my uh, workload so I'm doing as much as I can by email and telephones. If I can signpost a patient to a local renal social worker, I will do so. But I have enough work just in the Glasgow area mm. to keep me in a full-time job. Mm. Um, so at the moment, some of the country is being neglected, but that's now been remedied. We've recruited the right person for the job, and that lady will be coming on board at the end of August. Brilliant. And that's August 2018? 2018, yes. Um, and how many advocacy officers are there at the moment in the whole team? There are 10 in the team uh, and there will be 11 by the end of the month. Brilliant. And we all work together as a team despite being in different parts of the country and indeed in different countries. Okay. Well, I just know on behalf of all kidney patients that you help, you do a great job. So thanks a lot. Thank you.